This is a lot better. All right. Luke 19, verses 1 to 10. The title of the sermon is To Seek and Save the Lost. To Seek and Save the Lost. So we come to our text, and Jesus, after healing a blind beggar in Luke 18, enters Jericho. And we are immediately introduced to Zacchaeus. He is described as two things. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Actually, three things. We'll get to that later. Chief tax collector, and he was rich. And what we know about tax collectors at the time of Jesus was that they often cheated and stole money from people. They would collect more than they should and would skim off the top. So, for example, a citizen of Rome owes a hundred coins in taxes. This is what the Roman Empire asks of him. The tax collector would use his power, would use the Roman government, and would ask for 300 coins. He would then give the 100 coins to the Roman Empire and keep the 200 coins to himself. Some of these tax collectors were, all, were also viewed, or sorry, were also of Jewish descent. So they were often viewed as traitors and sellouts to the Roman Empire. And because of this practice, they call this tax farming, because of this practice, Zacchaeus was rich. And not only rich, as we see, Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. So he was the overseer of other tax collectors. He was the primary contact to the Roman Empire. Luke 18 gives us a picture of how hated tax collectors were. In comparison to the highly revered Pharisee, who was seen as the gold standard of righteousness, the tax collector was one of the lowest and most hated people because of what they did. Because they cheated people. And so Zacchaeus was hated to the 10th degree. He was reviled and considered the chief of robbers and the chief of traitors. Now here's a man who had everything going for him. Money and power. Nothing apart from the Roman Empire falling could take away his treasure, his influence, and his status. Though, at the cost of being hated by his fellow countrymen, he had it all. And, like I said, he, he's described three ways here. He, he was a chief tax collector, he's rich, and he's short. He's short in stature, small in stature in the ESV. And while Jesus was passing by, Zacchaeus was curious to see what he's all about. Jesus made all kinds of claims and has done so much. He's performed miracles. He's healed the sick. He's opened the eyes of the blind. He's made lame men walk. And so Zacchaeus was understandably curious. The text here describes him as seeking to see who Jesus was. And it was not enough for Zacchaeus to see a glimpse of, of Jesus. Today, with the power of social media, we have access to our favorite celebrities. We can see their photos, we can see their stories, we can follow their, their lifestyle, their lives, and it's become an overwhelming experience. So, for Zacchaeus, he wanted to only see Jesus face to face. He not only wanted, he didn't just want Jesus to see face to face. He wanted to see who Jesus was. So Zacchaeus goes about, and because he was short, he climbs a tree, a sycamore tree, hoping to witness a new miracle or maybe see Jesus heal a man or a woman. We come to verse 4 to 7. So Jesus walks up to the sycamore tree, and he looks up. And he asked Zacchaeus to hurry 
and come down. Let me read this for you. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. And it's here we'll see Jesus engage with the hated tax collector. And pay attention to what Jesus says here. He says, for I must stay at your house today in verse 5. For I must stay at your house today. Must is such an important word here. What does it tell us? It tells us that there is a reason for Jesus to interact with Zacchaeus. It wasn't some coincidence for Jesus that he was passing through Jericho and passing through the sycamore, uh, sycamore tree. We can confidently say then that this moment in the text, this moment in the narrative was purposeful and appointed by God. And we see the word must in Luke chapter 2 verse 49. Jesus tells his parents that he must be at his father's house. He must be about his father's business, his father's will. And there's one thing. One of the things I want us to understand here that there was never a moment in time in the life of Jesus that he had no purpose. Jesus was never lost. Jesus was never without reason and he never wavered from his mission here on earth. He says to Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. Not only was Zacchaeus and Jesus going to talk Jesus was going to be a guest at his home. For I must stay at your house today. At Jesus' word, Zacchaeus immediately came down the tree. And what did he do? So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Received Jesus joyfully. Church, Jesus' call, his call to us, warrants action from us. And not just action, not just us dragging our heels towards him. We must respond to him with joy. When was the last time you joyfully hurried to do something? You felt so much excitement and trepidation in what's to come that you couldn't hold your emotions and that you wished it were time to do it. So you, you were urgent in doing. You, you wish that today was the day. Some of us, it might be your 20th birthday, your 21st, 25th birthday, 28th birthday for me this year. Some of us, it might have been our 30th anniversary. For me, it was last year. You might say the wedding. Yes, of course, the wedding. But I was actually referring to September 26, a few day, uh, last year, a few days ago. I went to my first ever concert with Brenda. Um, we celebrated our four years together as a couple and four months married. And we had tickets to a meet and greet and a private concert, uh, VIP tickets. Um, this was her, her present um, for, my, for our anniversary or our four years. And it was a treat because the musician, Bruno Major, is the same artist who sang our first song, our first dance song. And I remember being on the bus to the venue and Brenda and I were talking and we were excited. We were thinking about, oh, what song is he going to sing? We, start, we were listening all month long to his entire album, memorizing the lyrics. Every day we were counting down, oh, today's 20, September 20, 21, 22. And as September 26 happened, we take the bus to the venue and we were excited. I imagine Zacchaeus felt this way about Jesus. As he was coming down the sycamore tree, Jesus says, come down. He ran down the sycamore tree. He sprinted down. He, he immediately, I imagine he fell. And he said, oh man, I get to experience, I get to see Jesus. Not only see him, but I talk to him. Not only talk to him, but actually get some time with him. Not only get some time with him, he gets to be my guest at home. He must have felt a great excitement. And don't miss this church. He called him by name. 
Never did Zacchaeus introduce himself. Jesus knew him by name. And so Zacchaeus received him joyfully. I want us to think about the time you received Jesus into your life. And when you had received the faith and placed your trust in him, did you experience joy in that moment? I mean, truly experience some, some supernatural happiness and gladness to say that I have Christ and Christ has me. I am in Christ. Was there a gladness in your life that maybe you've never felt before? I know of a person who, when they came to Christ, their life changed like that. Their life cha- turned around, a complete turnaround. Their relationships with people changed. The way they, that they interacted with people changed. When this person went to church, you could tell this person is a whole different person, a whole new person, a whole new creation in Christ. Did you experience that joy? And was there a gladness in your life that you've never felt before? This is Zacchaeus and Jesus walked over to his home. We read that the crowd grumbled. The crowd said, He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Similar to Luke 15, when Jesus shared a meal with sinners, the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at the sight of it. And so, the sinner and the saint, that is Christ, spend time together. And what could possibly come out of this? Let me first say this. This moment in the account of Luke and the gospel of Luke is consistent with the character of Jesus. Jesus was never impartial. Jesus was never impartial with his grace and with his goodness. He is willing to welcome and embrace those who are willing to listen and obey his call to come down their proverbial sycamore tree and receive him with joy. James 2.1 urges his audience not to be impartial, not to treat the rich so well because they were rich, or to look down on the poor man because he was destitute. As Christians, we cannot be impartial. We must follow the character of Christ. Just because we're friends with someone, we treat them well, and because we meet a stranger who doesn't necessarily look like us, doesn't necessarily talk like us, doesn't necessarily dress like us. Maybe, they, maybe they're, they're, they're working hard and, and, and they can't afford the same cars that we can afford. They can't afford the same house that we can afford. Let us not be impartial because the gospel is for the rich and for the poor. He has gone in to be a guest of a man who is sinner and let me bring back to you the context the chief tax collector not only was he a tax collector he was the chief among them he was the overseer he was the manager and it's important for us to see that his wrongfulness his evil his wickedness was never hidden his job is public knowledge and and his practice of stealing money from the tax collection was not a secret Given that the author Luke describes him as a rich man, we can conclude that Zacchaeus did not hide the fact from the people that he had money. He had their money. And because Zacchaeus heard the reviling and the hate that he's received from plenty of people as a chief tax collector, he was aware of how people hated him and how people saw him. He's familiar with the names that he's called and he's known He he knows how they feel about him. More importantly, as we come to the text, he is aware of his sinfulness and his wrongs and his failures as a public servant. But get this, church, this did not hinder Jesus from engaging with him. And in light of the text, in light of Jesus Christ, 
Zacchaeus, charged with betrayal, charged with fraud and theft by the court of public opinion, he goes to Jesus and unburdens himself of his sins. And put simply, the chief tax collector goes to the chief of grace. The chief tax collector goes to the chief of grace in need of mercy, much like the tax collector in Luke 18. So in light of Jesus, in light of interacting with Jesus, in light of engaging with Him, having an intimate conversation with Him, and in summary, experiencing Jesus, Zacchaeus in turn experiences a radical life change. He says here, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it, Fourfold, Exodus 22, 1 says that if someone were to steal an ox from another man or a sheep, he should repay him or restore him or, or return to him, to the man, fourfold. This is what Zacchaeus does here. His repentance from his former life, from his former man, not only meant that he wasn't going to do it again, that he wasn't going to tax farm, that he wasn't going to steal, but he made an effort to reconcile himself to the people that he's made Mistakes with. Church, how does this account in the gospel of Luke press us as Christ followers to live a life consistent with our experience with Jesus? Why should it matter so much to us to not only be reconciled with God, but to be reconciled with those that we've made a mistake with? And most importantly, what do we do about it. In hearing this, what do we do about it? Number one, and don't miss this, what we find in the gospel and in Paul's letters and in all the letters in the New Testament is that our new life in Jesus produces new action, new heart, new perspective, new everything. It's not that we're left on a sycamore tree to rot, hoping, glancing, waiting to see even a glimpse of Jesus' clothes. As Christ followers, we've got this intimate conversation with Almighty God in the Scripture. And God calls us to read it, and God calls us to know Him, and God calls us to be intimate with Him. Because of what we see in the Bible, because of who Jesus is, because of what he's done, and because, because of what he continues to do, we receive him and we receive him with joy. Let us consider, church, let us consider and reflect. Firstly, is my life truly in Christ? And secondly, do I have joy in Him? The kind of awestruck, purposeful, humbled, trusting, serious joy. And this joy, this joy, what comes out of it is a serious kind of life change. And in Zacchaeus' case in Luke 19, he was aware of his evil and his wickedness, that he extorted and defrauded people. And he knew his faults. He wore his riches with pride. He sat in his sin, perhaps wallowing or drowning, helpless and despondent. So by himself. And what came out of it? No man is an island. But what came out of it? What came out of his riches and power and influence? Nothing. Spiritual health, dead. Heart posture, dead. However, Zacchaeus, the same rich man, the same chief tax collector, is called by Jesus. And not just Jesus saying, you, come down there. He says, Zacchaeus, come down. I must stay at your place. I must be a guest at your home. And so Jesus invites himself into Zacchaeus' home for what we might describe as something brief. 
yet intimate. A brief moment in Zacchaeus' life in comparison to the many years that he persisted in his sin. Zacchaeus gets this appointed moment in his life with Jesus. And what happens? Everything happens. Luke 18, what might be impossible for us, for mere men, to have a rich man come to repentance and be saved, for him to say, away with my treasures, away from my power, away with my influence. What seemed impossible to us is possible with God. And it's possible only with God. So Zacchaeus goes to Jesus, I've done this, Lord. I've restored fourfold and I've made amends to those I've wronged and I will give half of what I have to the poor. And this was not a last minute stretch and hope of goodness so that he might receive favor in Christ. Look at this church. It was because he received favor that he had spiritual, mental, emotional, and practical he had the capacity to act in grace. Because he received grace, he acted in grace. You'll notice that he does this, and in the text we see it, that this happens as Jesus receives him, as Jesus calls him. This is crucial. And let me bring us to the main point. Jesus declares salvation came to the house of Zacchaeus and he calls him the son of Abraham, which is, a, which is an important distinct, distinction to give to Zacchaeus, son of Abraham. Because Jesus was unfolding the covenant that God had with Abraham and bringing Zacchaeus into the fold. And you'll see it here. That Jesus declares this on Zacchaeus, not because of what Zacchaeus did, but because of what? And we come to verse 10. Because of what? He declares him son of Abraham. He unfolds the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. God said, I will make you a father of nations, of all nations. I will make you a father of great nations. He says here, he brings Zacchaeus there and he says, you are the son of Abraham. Because of what? Because of what the son of man came to do. Our role in our salvation is that we are the sinner. Jesus' role and responsibility as Messiah is that he's done everything for us. So repent, believe, in the gospel. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He came to earth from glory to grass. Jesus condescended his throne and limited himself to the flesh of man, hence the title Son of Man, not only to be with us as his namesake, but that he might show us, show us truly what it means to be the embodiment of truth and grace. He was the better Adam, church. The Son of Man title is a very important title because it alludes to Daniel's vision in the Old Testament. We see this in Daniel 7.13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to the son of man, to him was given dominion and glory in a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed." The Son of Man will have glory and dominion over His kingdom, and His kingdom will consist of people from every nation and language, and His kingdom will not pass and will not destroy. So there is this contrast 
the Son of Man is deeply seated in this glory and power and authority. However, Jesus takes this Son of Man title. He receives it to say, I am human, truly man. And he lived a perfect life, free from sin. The life that we should have lived. And later we see the, the, the death that we should have died. How can it be that this title, Son of Man, holds both power and authority, dominion over all nations, and the, domin and the domination that is everlasting that will not pass away? How can it be that the Son of Man, given all authority to judge, came to seek and save the lost. This is the climactic peak, the melodic line, the harmony of the Gospels to show us and tell us, according to Luke, that Jesus Christ came to save us and, and to, take, to, to find us and to save us. It shows us his purpose and his mission. And let me repeat this. There was never a moment in time in Jesus' life that he had no purpose. Jesus was never lost. Jesus was never without reason. And he never wa wavered from his mission. Zacchaeus fits the bill of the lost. A financially fulfilled man who was morally and spiritually dead bankrupt however despite all of that we can see here that he is the prime recipient of God's grace by being found in Jesus Jesus sought the sinner when Jesus called Levi in Luke 5 who was also a tax collector he called him into the ministry he was faced with contempt and questioning why is Jesus eating and dining and interacting with the sinner. We see this in Luke 5, 32. Join me there briefly. He says here, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come, to call the ri I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. To repentance. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He comes to call the sinner home. He seeks out the sinner. It is the sinner that Jesus went out of his way to look for. It is the sinner, the wrongdoers, the money grabbers, the power hungry, the lustful hedonists who Jesus came and died for. And he gave his life for the vilest men and women, and he did it by firstly looking for them. Charles Spurgeon calls this the errand of mercy. How greatly have we inconvenienced the God of the universe that he had to run this errand of mercy to restore us to him. That he had to leave glory so that you and I can have a relationship with him. That we might have a fellowship with him in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. He went out of his way to the far reaches of this earth to find you here in this room at this specific time in your life. And Jesus is asking you to come down from your high horse thinking, you're, thinking to yourself that you can redeem yourself by doing enough good to recompense your bad. But the reality is you can't. You cannot match the gold standard, the diamond standard, the glorious standard of goodness that Jesus has and is and continues to be. Not only did Jesus sought out the sinner, he does not leave the sinner in his lostness. Jesus does not allow the sinner to stay in the unknown and dark void of sin. What does he do? He saves the sinner. Our life, church, our life is changed 
when we realize that the Son of God came down to find sinners and save them from once being lost to now being found in Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 1 to 2. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When Jesus finds us, we are found in him. And in realizing this truth, there is a sense of relief and joy that we can experience and continue to experience. When we proclaim that Jesus is Christ, relief because the weight of being perfect, the weight of keeping the law is no longer on our backs. It is Jesus who did all the work. He came, he sought, and he conquered sin. The greatest search and rescue history, uh, story in human history is God's salvation story for his people. And we can experience joy like Zacchaeus because he recognized that his sins were so egregious that he needed Jesus to forgive him. In church, we must be the same to experience this kind of life change, to come and reach repentance. What a moment that is. A turning away from evil and a turning towards Jesus. A turning away from wickedness and a turning away, a turning towards goodness. A turning away from hate the turning towards love. Repentance is an action. Repentance is also a posture of the heart. What this means is our desires and our thoughts no longer are bound to sin. And all of it changes dramatically. And because of Jesus, we have every reason, we have every capacity we have every faculty, every ability to obey God. To live for His glory. Why? Because we're no longer burdened by sin. But instead, we now have a life bound to grace. We are no longer burdened by sin, but we are bound to grace. If this is the first time you're hearing this gospel, let me tell you, there is no other message on earth that will give you relief and joy. There's no other message on earth. There's no other religion. There's no other philosophy that will say, Come now, sinner. Give me your sins and I will give you grace. Every other religion out there, you have to climb up a mountain in the molehill. You have to bring your burdens up. Here you say, give me your, Jesus says, give me your sin and I will give you my life. There is no other message in the world that, that says that, that unburdens us, that relieves us. But in the same time, at the same time, there's no other message that gives us relief but also gives us purpose and motivation, and drive, and reason to live, reason to be good, reason to love, reason to interact, reason to encourage, reason to come together as a church. There's no other religion. There is no other gospel. There is no other message. Jesus says in Mark 1.15, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel, in his gospel. Believe in Jesus. And all we need to do is say, Lord, save me. I put my faith in you and I trust you alone to save me from my sins. Only you can change me. It is by your goodness, Jesus, it is only by your goodness that I can be reconciled with God. And in recognizing this, and in seeing this, we come to a reality that our goodness is not our own, but Christ. 
Let me pray. Father, help us. God, help us. We're desperate for you and for your salvation. There is nothing else in this world, nothing in this world that offers any kind of joy, any kind of relief. All of it is fleeting. All of it will rot. But you, Christ Jesus, you will never waver. You will never fade. And your gospel is just the same. And you call us, you call us down. And you call us to be humble. And you call us by name. And you tell us to put away our sins and to repent and to turn away from them. But most importantly, to be reconciled with you. And the only way we do that is by, by saying, by declaring, by receiving, by understanding that we cannot be good. Only you are good. We cannot be saved by our works. We are saved by your works, your perfect work, your death. Because it was you, it was you, Jesus. It was you who died for us. It was you who took on the death that we should have died. And it's your life now that we can receive. Father, please open our hearts and and make this truth a reality in all that we do. That we might experience a changed life. Thank you for your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.